So we, we got quite interested in the underlying principles, and particularly um, the errors involved in, in quantization, in, in taking an analog quantity and, and representing it numerically, uh, which you can only do to a finite precision. Analog to digital converters in the early days of digital were, were really not very good and not very stable. So uh, quantization distortions were not that uncommon, actually, especially when some of these uh, recordings became available in a digital form uh, when the compact disc came out in, in 1983 in North America. And, and some of the early classical recordings, at least, displayed quantization artifacts, um, sometimes quite, quite audibly which shouldn't have been there, and I think generally they were errors due to um, improperly adjusted or improperly working analog to digital converters during the original recording, or uh, in many cases uh, artifacts of uh, the editing process uh, using undithered um, faders or other operations, digital operations. So it was quite clear that, that um, there were problems uh, if, you, if digital wasn't done properly. And, and we, we were interested in the, the quantization question. The sampling question is, is essentially a mathematical theorem. If one samples adequately, rapidly, uh, you don't lose any information if you're dealing with a band-limited signal. But if you quantize, you always lose some information, and, and that loss can be uh, uh, in the form of a distortion or a noise modulation, which can be quite audible under certain conditions. And the best you can do is uh, handle the quantization process in a way that makes the error independent of the signal. So uh, may basically converts it into a constant noise. And, and that's what a uh, proper dither does. But the theory hadn't been fully developed. Although actually, we, as we found out, it was known to a few people who had kept it secret. One of them was Tom Stockham of, uh, of Soundstream. Uh, and for proprietary reasons, they had discovered uh, the proper form of dither, uh, but it kept it to themselves and it used it. So when we discovered this ourselves in the mid-80s um, and, and published it, uh, people started saying, oh, I, I think that was known by some... And uh, uh, through a devious process, we eventually found uh, uh, people who had uh, demonstrated this to themselves and never published it. Tom Stockham was one. Uh, the other person was uh, Nelson Wright, and it was interesting because he was a graduate student at MIT in the late 70s, and apparently this question had come up as a problem for another graduate student. And Nelson had actually um, developed the, th the theory in order to solve the other student's question, and, and had never got around to publishing it because he got a job uh, at that point, and we were headed off to California to be one of the founders of Accuson. Through his ex-supervisor, I learned of this and got hold of Nelson. He said, oh, yes, I think I probably still have notes about this somewhere. He actually found it. He had written a handwritten manuscript about it. It never got published. That's from 1979. Tom Stockham discovered this in 1980. He, <laughs> he showed me his notebooks. <coughs> we uh, stumbled onto it around 1985. And so uh, Stockham and, and, and uh, John and myself have written joint papers with Robert Gray and, and Nelson Wright. So it isn't all now published. I think credit's been given to all the people, the early people who kept silent about it. But, uh, so digital audio for us started in the early 80s and our interest in it from a from research point of view.